doesn't have the p mongo subobject set as true. The visited attribute gets extended with Philly, and our ob new object Roger gets also inserted into the person collection because we created a new object. And as you see, it's Stefan Friends Roger name. It's a lot more easier to access any attribute just than using find and whatever with the DB refs. If you have noticed, it's very easy to create recursion there with person because I could add one more friend of Roger. Probably it's Stefan again because they know each other. So you can create a recursion which is uh, okay so far you are subclassing persistent because, the pers because those persistent objects we are stored the database reference which is then very easy to resolve with circular references but again if you are not subclassing persistent this is a big problem so with circular references Now we are coming to optimistic data dumping, which is process, process of dumping data during the transaction under the assumption the transaction will succeed, succeed. The problem was that we are doing modifications to objects during a request. And usually after some point, we need to do a query of MongoDB data uh, I have a sample in the next slide. And this query needs to access the modified data. So we had to flush first. And actually Mongo Persist is doing flushing before any query operation to have the object modifications in the database. Uh, some ORMs and Mongo, did, Mongo persist also tries to delay writing data to the database as much as possible because the last round trips you have, the faster you get. But the query is the point where you need to flush unless you want to re-implement the older query language. And to get, keep it sync with the database and your local changes is just pain. So the easiest was to just flush before a query. And also, Mongo persist keeps the very original state of the object at the beginning of tra the tra transaction, so we can revert in a case of a problem. So in the examples, for example, uh, if I would have issued transaction abort, the original state would have been restored in the database. The small issue with having no transactions on MongoDB is that the database might be temporarily be in an inconsistent state. But anyway, you have to embrace this with no SQL databases. And here's my example for optimistic data dumping. And change a few attributes. I could have a lot of code in between. And note, there is no transaction commit because the transaction is not done yet. But I need to count the number of foobar objects, which I just set. So if there would be no flushing before the querying, the count would return probably zero, which is not what I want. Most of the time, the request goes like this. I'm changing a few attributes or a few objects and then at the end of the transaction or request, I need to list them again. So that's the same story. And of course, the changed attributes or objects need to be listed, not the original case. Right, conflict detection. As I said, most NoSQL databases do not handle this. 
That means you just, you just write to the database and the documents and you have no idea whether someone changed it while you are doing your request. So we added the underscore pi underscore serial attribute, which is actually just a number which gets incremented on each change. This is good for conflict detection and conflict resolution. We have three types of handlers in Mongo, Mongo Persist. First one is the default, this no check conflict handler, which just ignores, yeah, first detects, but then ignores any conflicts. Actually, last flush will win. Then the simple serial conflict handler, which will detect changes by comparing that serial number and will always raise conflict error. And the third, resolving serial conflict handler, which will again detect the conflict and will call each object's underscore p underscore resolve conflict method to allow the object to resolve the conflict themselves. So having conflict error is a feature of Zop Toolkit because Zop Toolkit retries every request up to three times before giving up. That's good because usually on the second or third try, the re request will succeed because right conflict occurs when you get your data changed by a separate processes or threads request. That means if you retry, usually the other thread already finished and you can do your changes. So we just retry three times, then give up. We can have custom serializers in MongoDB, Mongo Persist. Because as you see there, date time date will create very, very ugly Mongo data, which makes let's say querying almost impossible. So in the date serials, serializer, we have four methods. Two of them decide whether this serializer is valid for the given data type. This can read or can write. And read and write itself does the real conversion. Mm, serialization, conversion. You just need to register those serializers in serialize.serializers and on the next right, there with ordinal, you get a nice number which you can then compare and query. Much more easier. So querying MongoDB. This is one very nice feature that we chose MongoDB. One important thing is that you get the collection from the data manager. Because as I said, all query methods will be wrapped to flush first. And if you get the collection from PyMongo, then it will be the bare bones collection which will not flush. The two easy ways to get the collection is by database name or collection name and the second is just use an object around. You can use the usual Mongo collection methods find, find, one, count, whatever. They will be wrapped with flush. We provide some extra methods which, oh yeah, the previous ones, the find, find one, return dict, as usual for Mongo. We have a few extra methods, find objects, and find one object which will return real objects. 
There is data manager load, which you can use if you have a database name, collection name, and the objects underscore ID handy to return the real object. We have object caching in Mongo Persist. Because database access and creating object in Python is quite slow. So we can cache as much as we can. First is database ref lookup for Python classes. Because most of the time you need to know which class to create, which class to use to create the object. We have an object cache which stores any object that was created for the current thread because you will want to have the same, very same object in the same thread. There is a document cache with, which will store any retrieved document from MongoDB. So you don't have to make the trip to the database. We have neat query logging facility which logs the calls listed there, including their attributes and keyword attributes. Now why we did this is because you can have the traceback logged. You know MongoDB has its own query logging facility, but that definitely will not give you the tracebacks. And sometimes it's very interesting from where your query or find method gets called. Also a nice feature of SOAP is the under traceback info, where you can put any data and that shows up in the traceback. Now we are getting to containers and collections. Mapping, Mongo con collection mapping is a dict. Actually, it subclasses use addict dict mixing, which should give you all the methods as a dict does. So get item, set item, del item, keys, items, values, whatever you want. With the Dunder Mongo collection property, you specify the collection name where you want the item stored within the database. The Dunder Mongo mapping key is that you specify the object attribute which should be taken as the key of the mapping. So this is the ZTK ish corner, why it's not just, because it provides a lot of nice features and the ZOP addition is just the events. Because on uh, adding an item to container or modifying object in ZOP fires an event but you don't need to care about those events if you are not using the ZOP toolkit. Contained container, done the name, done the parent are used in usual ZTK applications or ZODB applications to build neat tree structure. <coughs> and there, there is very important to have, let's say, the done the name, done the parent because of security and stuff. Mongo contained is the counterpart part of the ZTK contained <coughs> class. And it has to work quite hard on setting the Dunder name and Dunder parent properties. Dunder parent shouldn't be stored in the database because it might cause circular references, but it's still needed to have a neatly working security system with ZTK. Mongo container is again a mapping-like interface, but, but it, it adds uh, more features on top of the bare Mongo collection, like add, where you can just simply add an object without knowing its key. Find, find one returns objects, but those objects are contained, constrained 
to the scope of the container. Because imagine in the root, I have, let's say, persons and employees, and both are stored in the same sort of container. Let's say two companies, company A, company B, persons. And if I query company A, I don't want the persons of company B. So I have to filter, or actually the container filters the right items it has. It will have only those items in it, and find, find one will also constrain by adding the spec, the right spec, to those items. Row find and row find one counterpart will return dicts on success. ID names Mongo container uses the items object IDS key, so you don't have to provide your own name or key or whatever. Usual web application will be probably multi-threaded, so each thread should have its own Mongo data manager. We have utility for that. It's called Mongo Data Manager Provider, which you set up just once for the whole application. And in each request setup, you do get the utility and instantiate data manager. Uh, yes, this is the op component architecture in play, but don't be afraid. If you import the right uh, packages and do as the example does, it will just work. Don't be afraid of the details. Annotations. This is also a nice feature of ZTK or ZOP. You can store metadata or any, on any object. Something like Dublin Core or permissions or whatever. Well, Dublin Core is a standard for metadata like created, modified, which usually use with, uh, let's say, documents. Those get automatically updated by ZOP events. But you don't have to care about this, as I said, if you are not using ZTK or ZOP. And that was it. Questions? Thanks for the talk. So, um, how does this compare? Uh, have you done any comparison speed wise to actually using just ZODB? Uh, comparison, not, but. Uh it should be on par because uh, yes, ZODB uses most of the time file-based backend, which is also local. But for MongoDB, you have to go through the network, maybe, or if it's local, then it's also local. But it should be very much on par. Thank you. Uh, do, do you handle the auto reconnect uh, exception? You mean the conflict? No, what? when when uh, when you try to do a query in, with PyMong and it fails and it launches a an auto reconnect exception, which means that it will a try to reconnect again. Yeah. So it should work the second time in most of the cases. But I don't think so at the moment. And another one. Did you compare or did you check uh, Minimongo? Minimongo, a, a library quite similar. 
Oh, Maybe okay. it has less features. Okay. The thing is actually because the persistent package is coming from ZODB. So it's uh, quite handy in this case because it does the persistence will, will notify that an attribute was changed. So you don't have to do the handstands just in case. Any other question? So this is it, and uh, once we call the next talk will be uh, 3 p.m. here about all singing or dancing uh, Python by code. So, but check the program for all the events of this afternoon. Now we are uh, almost in uh, lunch time. Thank you.